Hi, everyone. I'm very lucky to be joined by three of the co-authors from the Chainlink 2.0 white paper today. Um, these are three of the, the smartest people that I've ever had the, the, uh, the pleasure and privilege of working with in our industry. And you know, they're here with me to discuss some of the kind of deeper aspects of what Chainlink 2.0 and the white paper is about, just to provide some clarity and discuss the parts of the paper you know, that they find interesting in, in different ways. You know, we, we have limited time, so I want to make sure we fit in, a, fit in a lot of thoughtful discussion. And I'm just going to ju jump into the details. Uh, I think that the first question that the, the paper covers very well is what are hybrid smart contracts, how they're going to enable, you know, something beyond what smart contracts do today. And I'd be thrilled to hear, you know, everybody's point of view on that, may, maybe starting with, with Ari. I think of hybrid smart contracts as a powerful generalization of a key observation in smart contract systems in general. And that observation is simply that it makes sense in smart contract design for a blockchain to function mainly as an anchor of trust and adjudication layer. There are very good reasons then for significant components of contract logic to run off chain. And a few of those reasons are First, uh, performance. Off-chain systems can help boost transaction throughput significantly. The desire to connect to off-chain systems. Blockchains, as we all know, don't have internet connections, which is why we need decentralized Oracle networks to begin with. Another reason is confidentiality. Blockchains are transparent by design, which in many settings is a good thing, but transparency, of course, is at odds with confidentiality. If we want both, we want to reconcile these two conflicting goals, then we need off-chain components in the smart contracts. There are a whole bunch of other sort of subtle motivations, but those are the main ones. You know, need to source randomness securely and so on and so forth. Um, hybrid smart contracts, as we define them in the paper, are really a generalized design pattern in which very broad functionalities are available off chain, but are secured or synchronized using on chain logic. And we talk in the paper about various ways in which we're going to support them. I'll let Andrew and Lorenz talk about what you can do with hybrid smart contracts. I'll just comment that it's equally important to recognize what you can't do without them you can't really do much more than issue tokens. And even the token issuance process becomes fraught if you don't have secure random number generation in some cases, especially with NFTs, which we may or may not get to discuss at some point in this panel. Andrew? So yeah, and I, I, I want to explain hybrid smart contracts this way. I think of it as a really natural generalization of what uh, uh, oracles already do. Um, so oracles are, are mainly about reporting information and the idea uh, to me of hybrid smart contracts is to generalize that so it's not just reporting on data but also performing some computations relevant to data. And I think this is a really natural uh, kind of design pattern that makes me think of like edge computing and Hadoop where the principle is to move computation near to where the data originates. And you get a lot of benefits in general from doing this um, like performance. You could imagine uh, computations that compress data right at where the data feed originates so that uh, uh, whatever eventually gets placed on chain is in a smaller form so it costs less. Uh, and then you also get benefits of um, simplicity by being able to uh, uh, essentially program uh, uh, what computations are going to happen on the data in exactly the same place that uh, uh, that data feed originates. Uh, so I see this as a really natural uh, kind of generalization of the kind of computations that uh, uh, oracles already have to do. So every oracle is already doing some kind of uh, data conversion, taking data from one source converting it into some format that can be represented on chain in a smart contract. And so if you just think of generalizing that to doing other kinds of computations besides just a minimal data conversion, I think you get uh, uh, this idea of adding some programmability to oracles. And thinking of it as a, as a hybrid smart contract is a really 
you know, good way to think of that because uh, you bring along all of the, the desired qualities that you want with smart contracts like transparency, accountability, being certain that the computations run in a predictable way, a way that you can check after the fact, you get the output that you want. Um, so you imagine uh, uh, using a smart contract kind of framework in order to you know, express what kind of application computation you, you want those oracles to run. So to me, it's this kind of very nice uh, uh, generalization that kind of matches a design pattern even that you see in, in other contexts as well. Great, thank you. L Lorenz, how, how do you feel about it? Um, yeah, I think uh, Ari and, and Andrew uh, already made some, some excellent points. So um, I would say, right, on the one hand, they, they can enable greater scalability. On the other hand, they can provide capabilities that are not available natively on a blockchain today, such as you know providing better ordering guarantees through fair sequencing services or providing secure randomness through VRF and so on. Um, but I think yet another benefit of hybrid smart contracts that, that we haven't talked about yet is that as we're moving into a multi-chain world where there's many different blockchains that coexist and have different technological foundations, since Chainlink is blockchain agnostic, hybrid smart contracts allow you to keep a part of your DAP blockchain agnostic as well. And so in this multi-chain world, you can then um, do, you know, you do less work porting your contract and your DAP over and over to different chains because you can keep a common core or what would be an executable on a, a decentralized Oracle network in the terminology of the white paper uh, of your DAP that uh, you can keep uh, the same between different blockchains you're targeting with your DAP. So I think that's yet another appealing quality of hybrid smart contracts. Yeah, yeah, I completely, I completely agree. Um, I, I think it's important to note that oracles and decentralized oracle networks are really more um, a complement and an enabling technology for blockchains than um, some kind of full replacement. So the, the way that I see this is that the on-chain contract holds value, releases that value, creates transparency about the state of the contract, maybe defines key conditions uh, that the contract needs to meet, possibly like you know what we put together with Mixicals or other, or other similar um, constructions of these kinds of uh, hybrid smart contracts. But the Oracle is responsible for all of these other basically decentralized services. And I, I think it is fascinating all the things that you can build with the additional decentralized services provided by decentralized Oracle networks. But I think they're useful as far as there are smart contracts on various chains that need them. And so I think there's this very important complementary relationship where the on-chain code has its very well-defined and clear and very important and uh, irreplaceable role. And I think the addition of decentralized services to that core code kind of can, can help that core code actually go to the next level, secure more value, do more useful things for, for the world's users, which is, which is what I think we're all excited about as, as co-authors on this paper and as people working on decentralized oracles and, and chain link and so on. So I think the next question then is just, just to understand this a little bit more is to consider how you folks see Chainlink already providing a certain form of hybrid smart contracts or some of the near term hybrid smart contracts design, designs where you see logic going into a decentralized Oracle network that, that you find particularly um, attractive or useful. And it, 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 it would be great to hear each, each of your point of, points of view on you know, which one or what collection of kind of decentralized Oracle network computations you think are gonna be particularly attractive or useful or, or interesting in your opinion. I guess I'd like to talk about a functionality we've not yet realized, but are working on and discuss in the white paper. This is something called FAIR Sequencing Services or FSS for short. People tend to think of, and in many cases rightly so, tend to think of on-chain systems as being more trustworthy than off-chain systems. But FSS is interesting in that it's meant to be an example of how off-chain systems can actually improve the trustworthiness of on-chain systems. All right, so blockchains are designed to be decentralized systems, of course, and many of them achieve strong decentralization. But a limitation of standard designs is that they actually have a temporary form 
of centralization. Right? A miner gets complete control over which transactions go in a block and how they're ordered. Now, normally a miner orders transactions by descending gas price, but it's not actually required to do this. It can insert or delete transactions at will or reorder them. And order, as it turns out, matters tremendously. Just to give an example, say user Alice places an order for some token called XYZ token with an automated market maker. Her transaction, if she's buying the token, will cause the price of the token to rise. A miner then can take advantage of its observing Alice's transaction, having the right to sequence it by inserting its own two transactions in a block with Alice's. And this is sometimes called sandwiching. One of its transactions buys XYZ token before Alice does, and the other sells after Alice. Well, why does the miner do this? After the miners buy transaction, Alice buys the token, and Alice's buy transaction bumps up the price. So when the miner then turns around and sells, it makes a profit automatically. And it's making this profit, this is the important thing, from Alice, right? By buying tokens before Alice, the miner also causes the price to rise. And that means Alice is going to pay more than she would have otherwise. Now, this example, this is an example of a phenomenon called front running. This example isn't hypothetical. Uh, miners have recently started facilitating this kind of thing pretty aggressively and even auctioning off the right to others to take advantage of a user like Alice in this way. Um, and this practice is becoming increasingly popular. This is the type or an example, the type of practice that FSS is designed to address. The idea is that instead of centralizing transaction ordering in the hands of a miner, let's decentralize it within an Oracle network. I can talk about what we want to achieve in an intuitive sense. What we want to do is approximate first come, first serve service, you know, like the ticket system at a deli. Once Alice submits a transaction, it's like she's taken a ticket and determined her place in line, and nobody's going to cut in front of her. And we refer to this as fair ordering. Uh, this is something I personally care a lot about. You know, I feel that if we're going to build a better financial system, one without the shenanigans of Wall Street, we need to achieve fair ordering. And this is what FSS is trying to do. It's aiming to lower Alice's purchase price for her tokens because she's not handing money over to a front runner, a miner. But FSS is a tool and we think it'll make a big difference. We hope it'll make a big difference. Uh, we're working to get into production. Uh, now layer two systems take the power of ordering transactions away from miners and vest it in the hands of whoever's operating the layer two system. We see FSS, among other things, as a helpful way to build fair layer two systems. And I think that enthusiasm is shared by the designers of those systems and also by DeFi projects concerned about their users losing money. Okay, I can talk next uh, uh, answering this. So, um, you know, this, this question is about like the present and the near future of uh, hybrid smart contracts. And so, um, Kind of building on what I said, uh, you know, for the previous question, um, I, I think that the the most immediate uses of hybrid smart contracts are going to grow very gradually, incrementally uh, uh, from basic data conversion. So, uh, I gave very vaguely the example of um, compression. You can imagine getting a performance benefit by having an oracle effectively compress a data feed of some kind before putting a compressed version or an approximated version or an aggregated version on chain. One example where this could occur is essentially applying something like a median filter to a price feed in order to get a, you know, a time averaged uh, uh, version of the data feed that gets placed on chain. That's really a computation, you know, this filtering applied to the raw original data feed. Um, if you generalize that just a little bit, you have the idea of using the hybrid smart contract to uh, define a custom index. So rather than just relying on existing indexes as uh, feeds that you would import, right in uh, the hybrid smart contract you're using to define the Oracle, you could define your own uh, index that applies various filtering and uh, uh, 
say, uh, outlier removal and combining input from different sources in order to provide a, a consolidated data feed that's you know, smaller and more efficient than to put on chain than just putting all of the original uh, uh, raw data feed directly on chain. So that's kind of the uh, notion of using hybrid smart contracts for um, aggregation and combining. Almost the uh, you know dual way of doing uh, of that is to take a single data feed, but replicate it to multiple different blockchain uh, places where that data feed would go. So um, you know this is already something that that uh, you can do by you know, having an Oracle instance uh, uh, for each different blockchain. If you really care about having um, exactly the same data show up in mirrored form in each of uh, uh, the different blockchains where that data feed is going to go, that's a really natural thing to define uh, using hybrid smart contracts to describe all the necessary data conversions to um, get it placed on um, uh, uh, all of the different blockchains where it needs to go. Um, it's the last example that I would give of this is um, if you think about the application of uh, insurance on chain, making use of uh, an Oracle report about real world events like uh, weather in order to determine the, the outcome of an insurance application. That's something where you can imagine there are plenty of existing data sources that are relevant to the weather, but they're maybe not in exactly the right you know, format that you want to make the uh, insurance pay out. So it's not just a matter of reporting the original data, it's really about uh, distilling the relevant like binary outcome, like yes, it's good enough weather, no, it's not good enough weather. And you would wanna use hybrid smart contracts as a way of defining how to take all of the raw inputs from several data feeds and combine it together just to get that kind of application level output. So um, I think altogether those kind of examples are, are what you could expect to see are the most near term, immediately useful applications of this hybrid smart contracts idea. Great, thank you, uh, Lorenz. What what are you, your views on you know the near term and and how you're already seeing hybrid smart contracts enable things and maybe the near term versions of that? Uh, thank you, Sergey. Yeah, so so I think Ari and, and Andrew gave some gave some really cool uh, near term use cases already. Uh, but but one thing I'd also like to point out is that in some sense, um, we already have chain link supporting hybrid smart contracts today. And, and that's effectively a lot of DeFi, right? A lot of DeFi couldn't run and couldn't work without having reliable, secure price feeds that chain link uh, serves. Um, and, and so you could argue that even today, the big use case for hybrid smart contracts is DeFi. Um, and beyond that, uh, you know, various uh, contracts that require secure randomness through VRF. Um, and another near term application that we haven't talked about yet are keepers, um, which, which are a new uh, product that Chainlink is launching that allow a contract to effectively be called whenever it wishes to be called, um, which solves a problem you otherwise always have, which is that contracts cannot initiate um, transactions on their own, right? Contracts need to be called by an external account. And so you uh, need to have some sort of supporting infrastructure off chain that takes care of initiating these transactions. And so what Keepers enables any contract author to do is to launch a contract specifying effectively an arbitrary predicate uh, for when the contract wishes to, wishes to be called and wishes to run logic, and then not have to worry about having any sort of uh, off chain infrastructure initiating the contract when it wishes to be initiated, but instead relying on Keepers to handle that. Um, so I think that's a, that's an exciting, very general uh, near-term um, application for, for hybrid smart contracts. And I think we'll see a lot of interesting use cases come out of that, some of which we probably haven't even thought of yet, but it will be, will be cool to see what people do with that and what they, what they can think of. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. I, I think I'm fascinated to see some of the things that people have even built at our recent hackathon and the kind of configurations of on-chain code with the various decentralized services made possible by decentralized Oracle networks. So the, the, the way I see it is really if we're at hundreds of Oracle networks now, if we're at hundreds of Dons now that predominantly focus on price data, I think we're gonna be um, eventually at thousands of different decentralized Oracle networks that each make their own unique decentralized service, whether that's a piece of data or a randomness input or a keeper function or, or any number of other more advanced computations that you want to do in an Oracle network rather than on chain in a contract. And then what, what we're actually seeing is fascinatingly enough, what we're already seeing 
is that there are smart contracts now that use multiple DONs providing different decentralized services, just like there are web applications that use multiple APIs to do different things. And the combination of what all those APIs do together with the core code of the web application allows it to provide this massive kind of advanced functionality. And, and so I, th I think that as more types of decentralized services and as the amount of decentralized services in terms of the types of data or the types of keeper jobs or the types of um, different uh, methods of fair ordering, it, depending on the user's demands for this type of fair ordering or that type of fair ordering, um, I think all of this will just provide a massive amount of options to users and then how they combine those options, um, as you put it, Lorenz, is, is really, I think, the fascinating thing that we all um, plan and hope to see redefine our industry the same way the early stages of DeFi have already come to mean what blockchains are about for many people. And so I think that's what the outcome and the result of a lot of this will, will be, which is, which is very exciting. There's, there's a lot of other innovative ideas in, in the Chainlink 2.0 white paper around trust minimization and you know, any kinds of, any number of ways that trust is injected into, into a decentralized Oracle network, everything from reputation to various guardrails to any number of other, other methods. What, one of the methods that was initially put forward in this paper and I think is, is pretty novel and has um, a serious impact on what most people know as crypto economic security is the super, super linear staking model. And you know, the role that that'll have in securing hybrid smart contracts by making these decentralized services highly reliable and you know, quantifiably secure, I think will be quite, um, quite interesting to, to see how that evolves. That, that's obviously its own complicated topic. And so I, I think it'd be great to get your, your, your feedback on, on how you feel super linear staking will, will play a role in, in the security and evolution of hybrid smart contracts. Yeah, our staking mechanism is something we're quite excited about. Oracle nodes already have economic incentives to behave correctly today. For example, if an Oracle node becomes unreliable, it's gonna lose users, and that means it's gonna jeopardize its future revenue. What we're looking to do with staking is bolster these kinds of existing implicit incentives. Now, in a staking system, Oracle nodes, of course, deposit funds to participate and they get slashed for misbehavior. This can be for performing an incorrect computation or for creating incorrect reports um, or any of a variety of other things. With staking, nodes have an economic incentive to behave correctly, not to accept bribes for corrupting reports, for example. The scheme we've devised, and thus the term super linear, um, has some strong, and I would even say counterintuitive properties. The most important of these is what we call super linear staking impact. Specifically, we believe we have a practical design that gets us quadratic staking impact. Let, let me explain what I mean by this. Imagine you've got an Oracle network with say 10 nodes and each of them stakes a million dollars you would think that an adversary could bribe all 10 nodes and get them to emit an incorrect report with a total budget of just over $10 million, right? The idea is pay each node just over a million dollars to lie in its next report. Right? That 10 times $1 million is $10 million. But in our staking mechanism design, an adversary would actually instead need 100 million. That's, as I said, we get quadratic staking impact. That's 10 squared times 1 million. And with a bigger network, it gets even better. If there are say 35 nodes, an adversary would need not 35 million, but 35 squared times a million, which is a little over a billion. As I said, this is pretty counterintuitive. It's a result that surprised me, I think surprised all of us, and it has important implications. It means that an Oracle network can achieve more economic security than there are deposited funds. In other words, you get real bang for your buck in terms of economic security. It also means that the bigger an Oracle network gets, the more the cost of economic security drops. There's a strong economy of scale. With five nodes, a dollar of economic security costs you four cents. 
with 10 nodes, it costs you just a penny and it continues to drop as, as you add more nodes to the network. Uh, there's been a lot of hard work by the research team and especially Dan Marotz, whom I'd like to mention here, um, to obtain this result. And super linear staking is just one feature of the system. I'll let Andrew and Lorenz talk a bit more about how the mechanism works and about some of the other nifty features we managed to get in our mechanism. Yeah, so uh, I, I want to try to take a stab at giving. Um, a, a, it's a bit of a tricky mechanism, but I want to try to you know take a stab at giving a, a high level explanation of uh, how this works. Like Ari says, this is sort of a, a counterintuitive approach. It was surprising to me. There's nothing I like more than a, a counterintuitive mechanism that, that that turns out to solve a big problem. Uh, so I, I you know I'm, I'm too excited about this uh, uh, result. So I want to try to you know explain at least the simplest version of it that I think I can get across quickly here. Uh, we discuss a couple of different approaches to it, but I'll discuss the simplest one, which is the uh, uh, sequential one. And again, the, the challenge here is that we want to take a fairly small security deposit that the contract has access to in order to pay out rewards for, for different behavior. We want to stretch that small uh, amount of capital in the security deposit in order to make a, a much larger uh, amount of uh, foregone reward that defecting nodes, lying nodes, would need to be bribed by the briber uh, uh, in order to compensate them for the, the lying behavior that they would exhibit. So the, the, the simplest approach to explain how we achieve this, um, this, this stretching of a small security deposit is that we basically, in, in the sequential version, get each of the Oracle nodes to make a decision um, in, in this kind of at this point in the mechanism, it's kind of distilled down to just a, a lie or don't lie uh, option. And we, we force each of the nodes, if they lie, to have to do so in a sequential manner. So the decision that each node faces is either uh, be honest, so report that a, a wrong value has taken place, which triggers the, the, the resolution handler for that. Anyway, their decision is either lie or don't lie. Um, if they don't lie, then they would get this uh, reward, the entire uh, security deposit that's available for it. If they do lie, they don't report the, the wrong value, then the decision goes on to the next node in sequence. So at each step, uh, if the node chooses to go along with the bribe to lie and not report the wrong value, they're foregoing that entire amount of the security deposit. But because they do so in sequence, the contract only has that one security deposit that it started with at the beginning. It, the same deposit kind of moves along the sequence as each node has to make their decision to lie or not. The end result of this is that the smart contract only needs one unit of the security deposit, but all N nodes, if the lie gets all the way through the end and the briber was successful, all N of those nodes would have had to individually make the decision to lie which is why the adversary then would have to bribe them that total amount of foregone uh, reward in order to reach the you know, end of a successful bribe. So it's very broad strokes and that's only one of the, the you know, variants of this mechanism uh, that we discuss, uh, but it gets across the basic idea of um, what the challenge in this mechanism design is, which is coming up with a way of stretching a very small pool of reward into a very large uh, uh, amount that a briber would have to offer. And uh, I think it's a really excellent uh, uh, mechanism, and so I'm excited about it. And hopefully, that explanation, you know, is um, you know an appropriate level of detail to get kind of the idea across. Yeah, Andrew, I I, I think I think what you mean is that if one of them is honest, they're all screwed. Yeah, is that, is, is what it comes down to, right? Yeah, and 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 everyone that uh, that was uh, dishonest loses loses a very significant you know sum in the form of their deposit. And then exactly. the one person that was honest gets the aggregate reward, right? So yeah. everybody who's dishonest is penalized and it only requires one person and an entire network to be honest. And it, let's say that network is not 10 nodes, but 30 nodes or hundred mm -hmm. nodes. You, you now have to make sure that every single participant in that network, you know, goes along with the fabrication. And if you even have one of them, they have a massive, massive incentive um, that, is, is going to be given to them because they were honest. And so this creates this, this really difficult prop, property for an adversary to convince everybody to be dishonest because even one person being honest would make the whole scheme immediately collapse in short order 
with an, an immediate consequence for all the dishonest actors. Is, is, is that, is that the right? That, 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 is, that is really well said. All, uh, a successful bribe would have to hit all of the, the, the nodes. Even one of them, you know, re reporting the honest value would lead to you know, a good conclusion for, for, the, uh, for the system. And each one of them is kind of exposed to the full amount of the incentive. So it would be you know, a very larger right. capital cost for a successful briber. Uh, so yeah, that's well said. It's it's great. I think I think it makes a lot of sense, and it and it and it replicates how, um, you know how 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 I think everything should 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 actually work. The person who's honest gets the reward, and the person you know who creates a fabrication suffers suffers a consequence, and that's immediate and immutable. And you know everybody knows that it's very easily detectable. So I think in that sense, it's 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 amazing work that's been that's been done there. La, La, Lorenz, what what are your views on 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 this more advanced you know form of staking? Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's a it's a very exciting mechanism. Um, I think one one thing I want to tie into that that you mentioned, right? As long as any one of them is honest, the system works. Yes, and what's even cooler, any one of them is incentivized to be honest. So we're not relying on the fact that one out of all of these um, nodes is is just honest because they're a good person. Uh, in fact, they have a strong economic incentive to be the honest one, um, and and that's I think a particularly interesting aspect of this of this mechanism. Um, I think an, another cool aspect of the mechanism is that it that it's modeled in a very broad threat model that that covers a lot of um, real world attacks one one could imagine. In particular, it deals with with prospective bribery, so um, with an attacker that is able to condition the payout of the bribe um, on whether the attack was actually successful or not, and and this is um, stronger than than what's been done in a lot of the prior work. Um, and, and finally, I think I, I want to point out that the mechanism allows us to, you know, amplify the security of a first tier mechanism to the security of a very secure second tier mechanism, um, but without having to pay the cost of the second tier mechanism uh, on every, you know, on every report that's being made, because the mere existence of this mechanism and the, and the um, trustworthy second tier um, layer that, that can adjudicate um, alerts raised by the first tier presents a credible threat. And, and the existence of that credible threat means that anybody that uh, engages in any kind of malfeasance you know, has to worry about losing their stake. Um, and so the nice thing is that, that due to all of that and the happy path, uh, you actually never have to pay the cost of the very secure second tier system uh, it's enough that it looms over you as as this uh, um, mechanism that will that will reward the the honest parties and to punish the dishonest ones. So so I think that's that's appealing from a cost perspective as well, and makes it quite feasible and realistic to to run this in practice. You know, on every report, even if you have very high volumes and, and rates of reports being sent to a contract. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. I think it's I think it's fascinating. There's there's two properties of all this that I think are are really next level. In in addition to this um, to this kind of super linear property, which which increases over time, um, I I think one of them is is the ability for the second tier to use technologies like Deco or Town Crier to verify um, the accuracy of a report and therefore very efficiently arrive at a dispute resolution. Uh, kind of result and outcome for the for resolving something for the first tier. So I, I actually think that once you layer on something like Deco or Town Crier or something that retains very clear proofs about misbehavior, you you can have some level of misbehavior. But I think the question has uh, sometimes been how does that get resolved? How does that misbehavior dispute get resolved? What are the proofs that people rely on to do that? And I think with Deco and or Town Crier, the efficiency with which people um, in the second tier or nodes in the second tier can understand what happened in the first tier and accurately resolve a dispute um, becomes very efficient. So not only does the second tier exist as this credible threat, but it, 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 it's following through on figuring out what actually happened can be made much more efficient than, than other second tier systems that I've seen, which is, which is something that I found very, very attractive. And then the second property, in, in my opinion, is this super linear staking kind of economies of scale gain that is, I think, going to be more and more important as more and more value flows into different DeFi uh, smart contracts, for example. 
because we already see that there are certain chain link Oracle networks that are growing in the amount of nodes based on the value that they secure. And so I think that um, eventually you're going to get to a place where you're going to have uh, a large multitude of nodes that don't need to provide an overly large security deposit individually, but they provide it in order to gain access to the fees from the from the kind of the the, the user base of that widely used uh, data feed, and then um, the size of the network and the efficiency of the superlinear staking model provides a very um, kind of wide ranging and high amount of security to, to more and more valuable contracts, which I think we are going to see. We are going to see more and more valuable, um, more and more value secured in contracts like DeFi. So in, in the paper, there's, there's also, you know, a fascinating longer term vision. So some of, some of the things we've discussed are the nearer term configurations of how decentralized Oracle network computations in the form of keepers or FSS or data feeds combined with today's contracts create um, you know, more advanced hybrid smart contracts. And then there's this medium term approach of super linear staking that's gonna, that's gonna provide this crypto economic security. But I think there's also a longer term vision for what we define um, in the paper briefly as the chain link meta layer. And uh, this meta layer I think is, is an even more advanced, a uh, longer term version of, of what's going on here in a kind of more scalable, usable, um, accelerated development type of format. And I, 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 I think I and a lot of people would be thrilled to hear your, your, your thoughts on it. Well, hi hybrid contracts are a generalization of something we're already doing today, which is combining on-chain and off-chain logic. And we try to make the process of bridging the on-chain and off-chain worlds as seamless as possible for developers but it's not invisible to them. The, the ultimate goal, and we're talking about something to aspire to over the course of years, is to enable developers and users not to have to think about the distinction, was to make this thing invisible to them, this uh, on-chain, off-chain distinction. And that's what the chain link meta layer is really all about. A developer can write a, a DAP, uh, what we're calling a meta contract in the paper, in a unified machine model. And it gets compiled down automatically into its constituent parts. So this developer's lending app goes and say fetches credit reports or some other form of financial data in a privacy preserving way, does some privacy preserving machine learning on it. Um, and um, then emits a score and sends some money to users on chain. The developer doesn't have to think about what components of this contract are resident on chain and what components are resident off chain. And the mechanics of all the privacy preserving tools here should be under the covers. None of the details should be exposed. That's the vision at any rate. Uh, again, it's just a vision, but it's a helpful one, I think, to keep in mind as people reflect on Chainlink's long term technical goals. Yeah, I'd love to build on this a bit. I mean, I, I think this is a, you know, almost past due, really important and necessary idea trying to unify the way that you write the on-chain and off-chain components to the point that they're uh, uh, in, the, in the future ideal version of this invisible, like Ari says, invisible to the programmer. Um, you can really work out the need for this just by kind of observing the way the you know programming tools for uh, blockchain applications are today, where there's a, a pretty clear lack of unity between the way that you write smart contracts, which is in a custom language, where the you know point of the contract is to be an object of study, like you tend to very closely scrutinize the interface of those, apply a static program analysis to them. They're kind of immutable once they're posted on a blockchain, so everyone knows you need to do your verification and get your smart contract really carefully audited uh, uh, and, and study it carefully. Uh, if you look at the off-chain component of a smart contract application that has an off-chain component, which so many interesting ones do, the off-chain portion of it is just written in a general purpose language like Go or Node.js or, or something else. And you know, if it, it, the, the blockchain specific part it has is maybe a, a binding to a library to interact with the uh, blockchain, like a Web3 kind of interface, but the code is still just written in your general purpose language. Um, 
And so your application spans these two languages. Anytime you're spanning an interface between two different programming languages, it's ripe for you know, hazards and, and, and programming mistakes. Uh, so there's a, a ton of potential benefit, even from gradual steps towards this on the path to this unified, uh, completely transparent language, where, for example, you may be able to use the same kind of program analysis tools that you apply to your smart contract. Now you can also apply them to the off-chain component of your DAP. So, um, you know, working towards building a unified way to write all of the components of a, of a smart contract application, both the on-chain and off-chain components in a common language is, a, I think, a really important idea. Yeah, and to, to tie into, into what you said there, Andrew, I really like this idea of having a unified program analysis, right? Because as we, as we all know, uh, in security, uh, the, the risks frequently emerge when you compose different systems together that on their own seem perfectly secure, but when put together in aggregate, suddenly things fall through the cracks and, and there are vulnerabilities. And so um, having a unified model and, and having unified analysis tools uh, would, be, would be super exciting. Um, I think another thing I'd, I'd like to point out there is that there is precedent already in some sense for, for things like a meta layer that allows uh, you know, generalist programmers to target heterogeneous architectures of all sorts. So if we think about um, things like GPUs or, or SGX, trusted hardware, um, we, we have such technologies to some extent already. So for GPUs, we have CUDA where, where as a uh, sort of regular C, C++ developer, uh, you can write basically C, C++ with a few extensions on top, and that can help you to target um, GPUs um, much more easily than if you had to, had to use um, more specialized languages and tooling. Uh, similarly, for, for SGX, there's now actually a whole bunch of different SDKs, compilers, whatnot, that all also have this goal that you can um, seamlessly split your application into a high trust kernel uh, that runs inside the trusted execution environment uh, and some sort of um, externally connected component uh, that you know runs outside the trusted execution uh, environment just uh, in your regular um, operating system. Uh, so I think I think there is some precedent for for this uh, being a very appealing and successful model. Um, and I think uh, what what we observe is also that technologies that are able to to um, allow generalist programmers to easily target these heterogeneous architectures emerge as the industry standards. Um, and so I think this is, this is also an exciting uh, long-term vision for, for uh, Chainlink and the, the um, middle layer for, for hybrid smart contracts there to, to really become um, the industry standard that people use when they, when they want to build hybrid contracts. Yeah, yeah, I, I completely agree with every, everything you guys said. I mean, I think it's fascinating to me where, where, where all of this could, could go as far as usability and the speed of iteration that a developer could participate in. Because the, the consistent thought that I have in my mind is that if you look at the web 2.0 world and you look at the speed at which developers there can both build entirely new advanced web applications and the speed at which they can then change those web applications and iterate on them and the degree to which a lot of security concerns and other scalability concerns and privacy concerns are abstracted away from them, right? And so they're able to basically compose a large set of services or libraries with, uh, with, with more and more advanced configurations. Then, and if that, that advanced, conf advanced configuration doesn't work, they just pop something out and pop something else in, right? I, I think that's really the thing that's missing from the, the blockchain industry and the smart contract industry. And part of the reason that people have built so many tokens is because they can, right? There is a very robust set of functionalities. There is a standard in the ERC-20 standard. There is a lot of tools and a lot of templates, and it is something um, immediately doable and replicable by developers with certain features being added and removed, which are already also being standardized. I, I think the fascinating thing about this meta layer and the compiler um, that would turn whatever form this definition of a hybrid smart contract um, had I, I think the fascinating thing is, is that it would actually really orchestrate the use of, of a blockchain. So I think it's very important to, to keep in mind that the blockchains and the layer twos and all of these systems will have a very critical place as the places where the primary kind of smart contract code will continue to live. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to accelerate the amount of contracts and the advanced 
um, usefulness of those contracts, right? So I think at the end of the day, this meta layer and the ability for people to have all these services and to configure them around the primary piece of core on-chain code more and more efficiently is really a win-win situation for everybody. It, it makes the developers much more productive and able to achieve their goals. It enables more smart contracts with more useful functionality to make their way onto various blockchains and layer twos. And um, it also creates a virtuous cycle where there's more demand for decentralized services because more people are building these smart contracts because they can build them. And so I, I think it's it's this kind of change in our industry that I'm I'm very excited about, and I think we're all we're all looking forward to um, as a result of, of of this body of work. But I I know that we we work on this not you know not only to see that technical impact on our industry and how developers build things, but I think we're all also here working on this because we genuinely believe that smart contracts and in 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 this conversation kind of hybrid smart contracts will have some kind of impact on society and, uh, and the world in general. So I, I, I think everyone would be thrilled and fascinated to hear what, what each, each of your individual views are on how you think, you know, if this vision is achieved or even partly achieved, what do you think will be the impact on the world uh, for the better and, and how do you see that? As I view it, historically, many of the great improvements in quality of life and prosperity of the human race have been pretty banal on the face of it. Stuff like hand washing and other hygienic measures or advances in material science, improved steel production, or uh, double entry bookkeeping. Right? Banal seeming things, but they've had a transformative effect. Smart contracts are really a kind of business logic automation when you get down to it, uh, a way to make that automation more efficient, more trustworthy. And that really doesn't sound like much, but it can have sweeping ramifications. I don't claim to know what those are. Like the NFT craze shows that nobody can predict how a technology is gonna shake up the world. But smart contracts are making a difference clearly and will continue to. And to reach their full potential, I, I think they'll need to be hybridized. Personally, what I would like to see, as I alluded to earlier, is uh, a better, you know, more equitable and more inclusive financial system. And I'd like to see better financial instruments in particular to incentivize good stewardship of natural resources, and in particular help combat climate change. This is something that I'm working on in my separate academic role. To put it another way, the best thing we can do to make the world better is to prevent extinction. And ideally, this is something that smart contracts, hybrid smart contracts in particular, I guess, can help with. So, sounds, sounds pretty important to, to, to me. Okay, let me take a turn at this. So I want to try to convey, you know, my my wildest fanciful vision of, of of where all of this is headed. So, you know, very broadly, I think that we will ultimately see uh, the use of blockchains and smart contracts to essentially completely uh, uh, reshape the way that societies work. And to be slightly more concrete, where I, I think you'll start to see this uh, um, kick in at some point in the future is um, the ability to make really effective ad hoc groups that can do a better job of collective decision making and a better job of uh, uh, allocating resources within a group. I think you're already seeing portions of these kind of experiments with um, the various DAOs that we've uh, uh, seen work today. Uh, but I think we're going to see more of these that work at you know, all sorts of uh, different scales, like essentially you'll have, you know, DAO family units with small numbers of friends that come from anywhere on the internet to essentially building, uh, uh, you know, larger communities and tiny civilizations that are able to function because of their effective use of smart contracts. One way of conveying where I, I think you can see there might be some value here is that uh, I, I think that in the future through the use of DAOs and smart contracts, you will Essentially, anytime you go shopping, it'll be like you have a really powerful corporate purchasing negotiator working with you and you'll see yourself get really great deals and essentially bulk discounts. 
because you're not just making purchasing decisions on your own, you're making them as part of a DAO that you're participating in. And of course, the details of actually making those work and uh, not fall apart from having, you know, management and, and, and you know, person to person issues, I think will come through the effective use of smart contracts to coordinate and the effective use of um, oracles to, you know, bring in real world information to help with that coordination. So that's kind of where I see the, the you know, a, an interesting direction going that I think will have pretty transformative uh, effects. Yeah, I very, very much uh, agree with with both Ari and, and Andrew there, and and maybe to to um, talk about it a little little more generally in some sense, right? So, so on the one hand, you have a, you have a more equitable financial system. On the other hand, you have this ability for people to more easily form uh, groups centered around whatever uh, common interest or activity they they like. Um, and I would I would maybe regard um, blockchain smart contracts as a as a sort of general trustworthy coordination mechanism or system that allows people to, to coordinate around uh, whatever activity it really is that they, they want to coordinate around in a, in a um, trustless uh, manner. Uh, but the, the thing that's in some sense holding this back today, and I think why we aren't seeing as much, as much adoption yet as we, as we could, uh, is partly uh, just that um, they're, they're expensive to run, right? Scalability is not so great yet. And I think um, hybrid contracts by being able to, to put more of the logic off chain um, will be able to, to improve that scalability. And I think that will, that will remain a fundamentally appealing proposition, even in a world where we you know, get next generation uh, layer one blockchains that have high throughput, because at the end of the day, um, you know, there's this thing called Jevons paradox, where if you, if you double the number of lanes on a highway, there will be twice as many cars and, and the highway will be congested again. And I think a similar a similar concern uh, will will apply to um, these uh, higher throughput future layer ones. And so, by having a general mechanism that allows you to to improve scalability and move more logic off chain um, on a you know application by application level, uh, will will be very appealing to make these coordination systems uh, successful and to to allow them to. Um, be used in, in many different domains uh, of, of life. Yeah, makes makes perfect sense. I I, th I think you know we we covered everything from uh, saving the human race from extinction to to shopping to to you know all the all the scalability issues of of covering both of those. From 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 my point of view, I I really think it'll have like like most technologies a different type of impact in different parts of the world. So I think think in the developed market, what will happen is that there will be a lot of transparency created from blockchain systems. And that transparency will lead to actually at the end of the day, much softer boom and bust cycles, because fascinatingly enough, it is the, <laughs> it is the extreme nature of the global casino that actually creates problems because, you know, the booms get to be too large and then the busts get to be too large. And unfortunately society needs to pay for the busts, but doesn't always get to participate in the booms. And I, I think as I've studied the booms and busts in, in at least the developed markets, a lot of them really just have to do with market participants not understanding when the boom has, has went way, way, way past the, the real um, underlying value of what's going on. And so with blockchains create transparencies, the booms get softer, the busts get softer, and, and kind of the world just gets a little bit, a little bit less hectic and volatile. For, for everybody as far as you know just 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 how high everything goes and just how low everything goes when it comes 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 down because of the disconnection from reality in in emerging markets as as the other part of the world um, I'm very eager and I'm and I'm thrilled to already be seeing people in places that don't have a functioning legal system don't have insurance contracts against weather events for their farm you know don't have a bank account because the legal framework of, of the country doesn't really enable banks to do anything but charge usury amounts of, of interest, right? Or, or even just steal people's money. And I, I think like the, I think like Ari put it, the, the way that Ari put it about a lot of these things being banal, I, I, I actually don't think that they're that inconsequential. I think a lot of people in the developed world are just very used to these things or they're used to assuming that they work the right way. But I think in emerging markets, what you see is that when people go from zero to one, you know, with not having any books, 
no paper books to having access to Wikipedia through a $50 Android phone, their, their life completely changes. And what I, what I really think will happen is that all this technology will get polished um, and, and the infrastructure will get built out by projects like ours. And then the eventual impact on the emerging markets will be absolutely massive, right? Because people will be able to participate you know, in the global market through a smart contract. They'll be able to get insurance. They'll be able to have a bank account. They'll be able to have all these things that um, are really the foundation of why economic activity is so efficient and productive and has raised so many people into a new standard of living in the developed markets. It's, it's really the ability for people to do contracts well, in, in my opinion. And so if we as a group of people and as an industry can achieve that um, shift in how the rest of the world transacts and interacts with each other and, and, and allows them to kind of collaborate in maybe not as advanced ways as Andrew described, but it, it advanced enough that they went from no bank account to a bank account or no insurance to some kind of insurance. I, I think that in and of itself is a very worthwhile body of work that I'm, I'm really thrilled about and grateful to be working on with, uh, with amazing people like, like you, um, Ari, Andrew, and Lorenz. Thank you so much for working on this uh, with me and with us and for making such a, such a great 2.0 white paper with the other amazing uh, co-authors. Um, I think we're really going to an interesting place where you know, blockchains and oracles combine to, to create an entire new uh, definition of what our industry is about. And I'm, I'm thrilled that we're, uh, we're, we're somehow contributing to that. So, so thank you very much and excited, um, excited to be building the future together. Thank you.